Well, a warm welcome from the Goulburn Valley. We're at the home of Liz Mann, an agriculturalist, a consultant and a farmer, sheep farmer. We're in apple country, uh, in Yorta Yorta country. And we've come to speak to Liz today. She's got a pretty interesting uh, story. But before we get to that, I'd like to um, just thank all the supporters that are uh, who have been making these videos possible. Thank you to all those people who are making uh, generative comments and uh, goodly comments and for also sharing our work. We're not on social media anymore. Um, so if you are sharing our work, uh, you're getting these stories out there. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so in the uh, top uh, right of the website. You'll see the subscribe tab and you can also support us by sending um, these videos on to a friend and suggesting they might subscribe. Thank you so much, Liz, for having us in your home. I thought before we hear about uh, your story relating to the vaccine, we would hear a little bit about what life was like for you before COVID. Um, yes, I, I work in numerous jobs. So I don't work like most other people do with one job nine to five. So I sit on a couple of agricultural boards mm -hmm. and I'm also executive officer of a national industry body. Um, before COVID, it was one national body that I was executive officer for. Now it's actually, I picked up another one, so it's two. But I was also working two and a half days a week with a dairy supply company, working with their organic dairy farmers, helping them improve what they were doing on farm and also get ready for international certification. Mm -hmm. So, And I also run a small farm with a pole dorset stud on it. So I was able to do all that myself. Um, yeah, and I'm a f active, fit, healthy person. Mm. I don't spend my life sitting on the couch. And how was 2020 for you? Um, yeah, I wasn't a fan of the lockdown. Mm. Um, I'm a social person as well. So mm. thankfully I d didn't, well, I don't live in Melbourne. So, and being country area too, um, I guess there was a little bit more movement around here and, I had a few friends that would come and give me a hand every now and then on the farm, um, mm. things like that. So that was all still allowed. Yeah. But yeah, working from home, I guess more of it, and especially for the, the job in the dairy industry, there was a bit of that was working from home. But then because we we're a central industry, we were still allowed to move around the farms too. Yeah. And then um, 2021 came about and vaccines came to Australia and then mandates came to Australia. How did that affect your life? Um, I had no intention of having the vaccine. Um, I'm definitely not anti-vax. Yeah. I've had probably more vaccines than most because I've traveled yeah. overseas. So I've had yellow fever vaccine as well and yeah. hep A. Um, but, so I wasn't anti-vax, but I'd done my own research on this and I decided given my health history where I'd had chronic fatigue in the past um, and based on a UK study, there was a 27% chance that I would have a severe reaction to the Pfizer vaccine and severe that was like more than three weeks to recover. Mm -hmm. So I had done my own research and I didn't really want it. And also too, I guess going back to the beginning of January, 2020, I'd actually came back in from overseas. Um, I'd gone through Chicago, San Fran airports um, on almost no sleep. And I came home January 2020 um, on the 3rd of January, I arrived back in the country. And four days later, I actually came down with, it was like the flu, but it wasn't quite right. Mm. So I did wonder if I'd actually had COVID way back at the very start. And when I felt like that, I did what you should do when you're sick, you stay home. Mm. So I stayed home, slept 16 hours a day. I had a temperature. One mm. night I woke up with a hacking cough and I thought, where did this come from? Um, yeah. I, I stayed home until I, and I didn't see anyone until I came good. So I, maybe I had COVID there. I don't know. Mm. So mm. I, I had no intention of getting the vaccine. Um, and when the Victorian government brought in the mandate and everyone had to be double vax, I think it was by the end of 26th of October. Or, mm. um, I hadn't even had anything at that point. So I, I told the company I was doing this contract work for that, I, I wasn't vaccinated at that point. Um, they agreed to allow me to work from home for another couple of weeks. 
and then I took two weeks off um, and then I did agree to have the it's vaccine. Really, mm-hmm. really but, extending. Yeah, I extended <laughs> well, it as long as I could, yeah, hoping that the mandate yeah, would yeah. not be extended past like the 20th or whatever of November. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the morning of the vaccine, because the company was at me, well, when are you having it? And I sent him an email and said, I'm having it today, but I do not want it. And yeah. Mm. So so my appointment was at 10.20 at the Murchison Medical Clinic, um, drive through clinic. So, and by 10.25, yeah, that was the end of me. Mm. What happened? Um, blood pressure went straight up. So my blood pressure is normally around that 110 over 60. Um, I hit 160 over 100 within five minutes. So I was sitting in my car. Um, so we were told to, you know, they tell you to wait the 15 minutes, mm-hmm. park your car. If you have a problem during that time, honk your horn. Mm-hmm. Um, so I literally just parked my car, wound the windows down, turned the ignition off, and then I thought I'm going to black out. So I honked the horn, turned around, looked at him out the back um, window, and then just I had to knock the seat down in my car. And then by the time they got to me, they did my blood pressure, and I'm just going, nah, that's that's high for me. And then mm. they, um, I was going to crawl onto the back seat of my car, and they said, no, 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 we can't let you do that. And they put me on in a wheelchair and then onto a bed. Mm. So and then yeah, about I don't know, so maybe an hour and a half later or something, they yeah. The ambulance picked me up. Mm. What's going through your mind at this stage? You 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 were reluctant to get it. You you'd done your own research in a country which actually, I mean, compared to Australia, has a lot more medical diversity and the ability to debate and to mm-hmm. discuss um, the vaccines. Yeah. In, in England, what what is going through? you at the, at this stage i was pretty upset um yeah i, I but i never expected that sort of reaction mm. and i definitely didn't expect a reaction that day um i was mm. coming home that day to feed livestock and turn the irrigator off so i kind of thought i probably had 24 to 48 hours before i felt mm. just rotten yeah. um so yeah i was oh, it was probably a whole heap of emotions but i i, I know i was i was really upset i was annoyed frustrated you know that yeah i didn't think that that would get me so quick Mm. and i'm like how it just wasn't meant to happen like that i guess and how did the medical staff react well (laughs) another doctor came that one of the senior doctors in the practice came out as well um and two of them stood back with their arms crossed and kind of just watched from a distance and made the comment, well, wonder what will happen when she has the next one. And oh, wow. um, I think they had a bit of a laugh between did they, them. Do they know you? No, you, no. You, you, I yeah. I had been looking at making that clinic my doctor's clinic because yeah. I sort of, my the doctor I'd seen for many years in Shepparton had retired and right. since then I sort of hadn't really, yeah, mm. settled and I was looking to find one this side of the river instead of in yeah. Shepparton. Um, yeah, so I had intended to make that. And I'd heard good reports about that clinic, but yeah. my experience that day was far from good. Yeah. And then, and the interesting thing was when I looked at my Medicare claims history from that day, so they claimed, I think it was $111 or 110 through Medicare for the initial consult. And then they put in a claim to Medicare for administering the first vaccine. And then they also put in a claim for administering a subsequent vaccine. And then the senior doctor that came out also put in a claim to Medicare for watching the reaction happen. So when I when they were both standing there and they made that comment about wonder what will happen when she has the next one, and I said, I'm not having the next one. And they just said, we'll see about that. Wow. So, wow. so after- and doctors get $35 a, a jab. Um, Seventy dollars for for fully vaccinated when it was two yeah, two jabs. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's about roughly what they. Yeah, did. I think it was a little bit more for the first one than the second one. Right, yeah. But that medical yeah. centre put in a claim to Medicare wow. for both vaccines. So you look at that and you go, did they give me two in one, well, or yeah, did right. they put in a fraudulent claim to Medicare? I. I and and <laughs> I did they did they aspirate before they? No, no, they just stuck the needle in. Right. 
And so how do you know that that they put in for two shots? Um, well, on your mobile phone, through the Medicare app, you go in and it's a section called View Claims History. Right. And I actually clicked on that and I was pretty horrified when I actually saw what had been claimed for that day. Right. So I wonder if that's a common thing. Um, I guess most people, I know I've mentioned it to a few people and they go, we never check our Medicare claims history. So it makes yeah. you wonder how often does it happen? And, and, and you, you have no recollection of accidentally receiving two shots in unless one Unless they gave me two in one. But the interesting thing was then when I looked at my immunisation history, I wasn't even showing that I'd had one vaccine. Mm. Um, so then I spoke to the clinic twice, like around, might have been day 12, day 13. Oh, yeah, we've been busy. We haven't had time to enter that data into the immunisation database. And then... On day 13, um, it still wasn't showing like later in the day and because I think I'd spoken to them also that morning and then I rang the COVID hotline mm. and they actually said to me, oh, they've got 10 days to legally lodge that you've had an immunisation. I said, well, we're on day 13. How, am I, how do I know if they're even going to do this? Mm. So then she actually rang them while I was still on the phone and after I got off the phone from that phone call, I was actually recording on my immunization history that I had one vaccine. So yeah. she did it straight away at that point. Right. But this was day 13. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. So according to that, I've only had one. But according to the Medicare claims history, I had two. Have you had a, any um, previous experience with the medical system or your, a medical centre um, in this way? I mean, is, is this a surprise to you how you were treated? Yeah, it was more mm. what, like that day, um, like the nurse and everything, like the nurses were good. Mm -hmm. um, they kept monitoring me. And um, so that side I couldn't fault them. But I did go after, so after three presentations to ED then that week, mm. I and they were saying to me I had to go back and see my GPs. And I'd had an appointment. I'd made an appointment to go back there to that same clinic on the Monday. So I had the vaccine the Tuesday before. And I went back on the Monday and because I'm not double vax, I wasn't allowed inside the clinic. So I had to go to the tent out the back. Yeah. And then, yeah, the doctor came out and she said to me, there was nothing wrong with me. She took my blood pressure. I did request another set of full bloods because mm -hmm. in that week, my white cell count had dropped from a very healthy 6.5 down to, I think it was about 3.9 and I wanted to you get have, that checked again. You, and you had documentation of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So they'd done, each time I went to ED, they did right. the first day, they did mm -hmm. full bloods. Yeah. Um, and then they had done them again um, a couple of days later. So mm -hmm. I had that record. So yeah, the doctor just did my blood pressure, told me that I was fine, there was nothing wrong with me. And I said, well, can I get an exemption to the second vaccine given how I'd reacted? She said, no. We don't give them out. We don't do them. I said, well, how do I go about getting one? She goes, you're going to have to get one from a specialist. I said, well, how do I get to see a specialist? Can I have a referral? No, we don't do them. Oh, wow. You'll just have to go back to ED. So I left that day thinking, well, ED's told me to go to the GP. The GP's telling me to go to the ED. Yeah. So. And what are your symptoms at this moment? Um, I had chest pain, um, shortness of breath. Yeah, it was all it was all chest related at that point. Mm. Um, day ten, I got a rash. Mm. Day fourteen, I got spontaneous bruising on my legs and also a black eye. Mm. And then, so and that, when I got that spontaneous bruise around my eye, um, the eye socket area really ached. Mm. And I ended up going back to ED at that point because I was concerned there was like random bleeding. Um, so they did transfer me at that point from ED to the private hospital. Um, and I think that was mainly to pacify me, to prove to me that there was nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. So while I was in hospital, they did put a heart monitor on me, but laying there, that was never going to flare up again. Um, when my heart would do crazy things, that was when I was doing something physical. Mm -hmm. So I think it was because... All this happened the first day. They discharged me from hospital that night. I came home the next day. I proceeded to feed livestock. Mm. So do all the things I was going to do the day before. Um, and I didn't think I was going to make it back to the house. So the ambulance picked me up in the paddock. 
And then I think it was a few days later, I had a tree come down on a fence, which I had to cut off the fence and repair the wires that were broken. So once again, you know, with a chainsaw and the tractor and everything trying to do that, it took me probably three times the length of time it would, should have done. And I didn't think I was going to make it home, like back to the house. Mm. I was really, really not good at all. Mm. Um, yeah, so it was all chest pain related, nausea. Um, and yeah, but then once the other symptoms started and that like the eye socket remained sore and then about I think it was day 41 I woke up I was in central New South Wales trying to work up there staying at a friend's place and I woke up I actually thought I'd had a stroke um, and bef when I went out to the kitchen that morning friend said to me the first thing she said to me was how did you your eye is drooping so it was quite obvious to her um, that and I yeah I just I didn't want to know about it so, yeah, so, and since then, half my face is numb. So mm. instead of just being sore and aching around this area, it's the whole left side of my face now. Mm. So. And you could work in New South Wales, but you couldn't work in Victoria. Do you want to tell us yeah, about that? Yeah, so because of the work mandate in Victoria, um, in agriculture, like everyone, if you leave home in Victoria, you have to be double vaxxed to work. Yeah. But in New South Wales, agriculture was never mandated. So, and same like agriculture was never mandated in um, Tasmania, South Australia, Queensland. Mm -hmm. So one of the organisations I'm the executive officer for is actually registered in New South Wales and the chair sits in Queensland. So I could drive across the border and still do work for them. So, yeah. yeah. And you had your contract terminated while you were in hospital with your adverse effect events so or your symptoms after the shots yeah so um because the company i had a two and a half day a week contract with mm -hmm. um i'd actually they'd been in touch with me and i'd sent him a message on the day of the vaccine to say i've reacted to it i'm in hospital um and the person was quite like sympathetic at that point um and then i'm like well i'm not going to have another vaccine he said but you'll get an exemption won't you i said no i don't think so by what i'm hearing the exemptions are almost impossible to get um so there's no guarantee i'm going to get, a, get an exemption um anyway he the person i was in contact there he then consulted the business manager and came back to me and yeah it was not possible to continue with them without being double vaxxed because they were following the government mandate. So I got an email from the business manager saying, um, because they were following that, I was, I think I was, I was not permitted on the site or, you know, to work for them until that point that I had the second vaccine. So that wasn't going to happen. So, mm -hmm. so I was actually terminated while I was in hospital, trying to recover from the first vaccine. Mm -hmm. But, and also, too, every doctor I saw during that time, all they wanted to do, including the doctor I saw in the private hospital, he just wanted to talk to me about having the next vaccine, which I just said I'm not having. Did you have any empathetic or alt alternative medicine um, conversations? There was probably oh. one doctor or nurse at one stage in ED that actually, she said to me, she looked me in the eye and she said, now you know what these vaccines can do, you need to tell people. Um, but other than that, um, no, it was just pretty much about having the next vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, the GP that I then started seeing, um, a local GP, because I was new to the clinic, I ended up with a registrar. So look, she was really sort of out of her depth, I think, with me as well. Um, didn't know what to do. Um, yeah, so everything just took a long time. So... I asked her for a referral to a cardiologist or a doctor in Shepparton that could do an echocardiogram. I asked her for a referral to a neurologist. Um, and look, she did do all that and help refer me on. Um, but it was just took so long. And then with Christmas in there, with the specialists all taking three weeks off over that time, I didn't actually get a diagnosis or get an echocardiogram until middle of January. And that came back with, I've actually got it here. So... Um, the diagnosis was possible that this lady has ongoing pericarditis and mild myocarditis. 
So what did the doctors in Murchison say to you? Well, I never went back to them again. But did they did they admit that you were having an adverse reaction? No, they just didn't want to know me. Told me I was fine. And mm. like each time I went to the hospital too, and it's written on my file, um, expected a normal reaction to the vaccine. Wow. So they did link it to the vaccine, but I was told different symptoms. So they didn't really want to investigate my heart or refer me on to get an echocardiogram done. They did do an x-ray on day one. Um, and then from there, they told me, oh, the muscles in the chest cavity were hurting. Um, another one was, oh, you've got a reflux thing happening. Um, you know, it just sounds like inflammation around the heart, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I've done a freedom of information back onto the hospital to get my records. Yeah. And one of the handwritten notes on one of my files was something along the lines of um, um, in the morning, need to investigate psychological issues because mm. she is a frequent visitor to ED. Oh, my goodness. So I guess we all go to ED because we've got nothing better to do with our day. I don't know. But I was pretty horrified when I read that and I thought, well, that kind of explains why I was treated the way I did. Yeah. Um, but even though, like, they did still write on a lot of my discharge, well, majority of them, I think there's only one there when they just said it was reflux or something like that, gastrointestinal issues, but everything else was linked directly to the vaccine. So even that letter when I had the echocardiogram goes on to say um, it was vaccine-related. So. And presumably five minutes, reactions five minutes after you were given the vaccine, it makes it quite difficult to fob it off to something else. Mm -hmm. you, um, this, so it's been several months and uh, what, what, what's your, what are your days like at the moment? And what, are, what, are, you, what are, are some of the symptoms that you still have? Yeah, I still have, so chest pain's pretty much constant and half my face aches. And if I do anything physical, then the pain just increases. Sometimes it's the chest pain that will increase first and then the face pain follows, or sometimes it's the face pain that goes first and then the chest pain follows, but they're linked. Mm. It's really weird. And, yeah, so then because doctors have said, oh, just, you know, take painkillers and do this. And I say, then, like, last week the pain was increasing again, and so I... I I loaded up on the painkillers again. Um, and now I think I've done my stomach. Or, and back, mm. oh, would have been about two months ago after I did what the doctor said and I was taking Panadol like three or four times a day to the maximum dose. And then I ended up with one of my full blood tests, the my liver function tests, mm -hmm. um, indicated that there was potential liver damage. But then I had an ultrasound and my liver looked fine. But something was going on at that time because I was very nauseous, couldn't, I couldn't really eat, I couldn't like, yeah, and yeah, I, I reckon I'm similar now. So I think that's... Have you um, come across the Swedish study looking at um, mRNA, Pfizer, BioNTech vaccine, um, the trans reverse from RNA to DNA in the liver cells? There's a whole study that's just oh, come out okay. on it showing um, the potential for liver damage with a, with a Pfizer. Um, mm. There's, a, yeah, I can send you that link. If yeah, you like with... I'd be interested in that because mm. I have read some information where it talks about your liver function tests may be elevated and that's actually what happened with mm. mine. So I think it was the a a l a s t and ASL or something. Those two tests were both elevated. Right. But then the next test a month later, they were back in the normal range. Yeah. So that was never really investigated any further. Mm. Um, but last week, because I loaded up on painkillers again, so I could try to function and try to do more work because um, the pain had increased again. Yeah, I've crashed again this week and spent mm. a couple of days in bed again. So I did see one GP who did a vitamin C infusion Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it's three hours away, so that a six-hour return trip, and I did that twice in a week, mm -hmm. and that did actually help. So that's a mega dose intravenous yes. vitamin C. Yeah, and and that probably I felt quite good after that for a week and a half, two weeks, mm -hmm. 
and then I did one long day. Um, not, not what I would call a long day normally, mm-hmm. but a long day, I guess, since the vaccine. Um, and then that just, I've gone downhill gradually since then mm-hmm. and probably, yeah, bottomed out this week. So hopefully I'm turning the corner again. Mm. In terms of public health authorities and the public health orders um, and the pandemic bill in Victoria, all of these things are very hard-lined in mm-hmm. terms of, as you as you mentioned, n- not being able to get um, an exemption. Um, I mean, do you feel now that things have calmed down somewhat since the end of 2021? Now we're in May. Do you feel supported by public health of- officials and is there any no. support? <laughs> no. So. I got, I did get a, once I got the diagnosis of pericarditis and myocarditis, I did qualify for a three month medical exemption. Mm. So that ran out on the 18th of April. Mm. And then in the lead up, probably 10 days prior to that running out, the amount of stress that it put on me to think, well, what am I going to do here? I am like, I've just picked up new work. Um, I'm lining up meetings in Melbourne, you know, I'm still going to have to be double vaccinated to go to these meetings. Um, what, so I still needed my medical exemption extended if I was like going to be continuing some of this work. Um, and yeah, so I, I have got it extended now until June. Um, but you know, I didn't need to go through that additional stress. Um, there's no such thing. Well, I don't think there's any such thing as a permanent medical exemption. So if I have a reaction to penicillin, the doctor never wants to give you penicillin again. But if you have a reaction to the vaccine and I had a rash to that as well as the other symptoms, heart related, they want to give it to you again. So you kind of think, well, what's the point of trying to recover when what in six weeks time, does the government get to kill me? Like Mm. it doesn't really, it's not good. And I know I'm not the only one going through it. And we all have our good days and bad days, just struggling with the health issues. Um, And as I said, I crashed this week and spent two days in bed. And that's typical of what people like me are going through. And then the added stress of this other stuff, like can we work, but in Victoria, because the the pandemic bill and the Andrews government has kept the work vaccine mandate in place. Um, yeah, if I want to work in this state, I'm meant to be double vaxxed, but I can drive across the river and I can work, Hmm. but it's based on science apparently, which I'm still trying to figure that out. I mean, as a scientist, (laughs) um, I guess this has really opened your eyes to what science is in and what science is motivated. And I think we need a, a big cultural discussion about the, um, captured science, and as we do, captured government and captured media. Um, And we've made a lot of films around that, um, around these issues, just um, looking at the corruption uh, in in those areas particularly. Has what you've experienced with your vaccine injury and the way you've been treated, has this altered the way that you're going to vote? yeah, how you're going to consider preferences and things like that. Yeah, and look, I look at it and I go, and I've contacted the politicians in this area, both state and federal, and like you talk to the state once and they go, oh, but, you know, the, the vaccine, like the temporary exemption, medical exemption, oh, that's a federal issue. So mm-hmm. federal could make access to the medical exemption easier. Mm-hmm. So they're partly to blame. But then you go, the state under the Andrews government's also implemented and enforced that vaccine mandate on every worker in Victoria, whereas every other state, it hasn't been like that. It's The system's not working. And, well, it's letting down people like me too. Yeah, and both state and federal are to blame. Both of them could do something to make life easier for people like me too. And as I said, I'm not the only one. So I'm a part of a Facebook group. Um, for people that have reacted to the vaccine with myocarditis, pericarditis, and I think there's around 350 members. So that's just an Australian group. Mm. And we're sharing our experiences and sort of bad days, good days on that. And yeah, there are people going, well, I'm five months on, which I am. 
um, I'm nine months on or six months on and, you know, still struggling with symptoms. Mm. Um, I think I saw one, they were more than 12 months on, still struggling. But then you do get the odd few stories where people are going, I think I'm, I think I'm recovered from this. So that mm. does give you a bit of hope because we all think, are we going to recover? Mm. So I have started seeing a cardiologist now in Melbourne. Um, and I'm just waiting for an appointment now to get an MRI and CT done on my heart to see if there's any permanent heart damage, which I'm hoping there isn't. Um, but I guess I need that to really know. So, I mean, I was fit and healthy before. I was on a chainsaw cutting down trees during my two weeks I had off. I hooked into everything I could at this place. Um, I had a couple of trees that had dropped branches and I, yeah, so I was on a chainsaw doing everything and physical work and i was fine i couldn't have done that if i had a heart condition the um, message we got rammed down us was roll up your sleeves for vulnerable people well you rolled up your sleeve and became a vulnerable person because i've had so many full blood tests done i know what the first vaccine did to me um and i I was concerned it was going to wipe out my natural immune system. Um, I have had a tendency to have low white blood cells in the past and low neutrophils or lymphocytes. Um, and it did exactly that. And I've got that and evidence that's why there. So that's why reluctant. I was reluctant yeah. because I thought I'm really healthy. Mm. I don't want to feel rotten for, I don't know how long. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I've got the evidence there in my blood test to go, this is what it did to my white cell count and the neutrophils and lymphocytes, and they drop to um, the bottom end of normal or just below normal. Yeah. So. And when you look at the disease profile of COVID, it's, it, it loves to be inside. It loves air conditioning. It loves elderly people and people with um, obesity and heart disease. Um, so the comorbidities and the elderly profile mm -hmm. when you're living as a, a fit woman in regional victoria living outside most of the time plus you're concerned about the health implications of taking this vaccine it just sounds like all of your science training and all of your intuition came together to make the right decision excuse me well i made the wrong decision in the end i gave in to yeah. I, I was coerced into it and yeah. i gave in yeah. And I've got the email there that morning to say, I don't want it. Mm. So if I could wind the clock back, I would have just said, terminate me now. Let that job go. Yeah. And I'd have my health. So at least then I could do the other work that I've got. Whereas now, like I've even struggled to do anything. Mm. Um, and the last two days, I've, so I've picked up another job now based out of South Australia. And the last two days, I should have been doing some of that work. Um, and I met with the chair last night via Teams and I'm just like, I'm so sorry. I haven't been able to do anything for the last couple of days. What do you think lies behind the health authorities? Is it corruption? Is it... Control? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But, like, to, yeah, it's just each time that that work mandate the pandemic bill came in and then when it was just recently extended again for another three months it's just like another kick in the guts mm. um i just yeah so it's control but what for uh, 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 that makes you wonder mm. Mm. going into a hospital now as an unvaccinated person do you have any concerns with that or even a medical center do you feel comfortable to go into these spaces um yeah my local gp um hasn't discriminated against me at all um i've just gone in and that's fine I mean, wear a mask um going into i have been into the hospital for a i might have been for an mri and because i wasn't vaccinated i think i think there was i can't totally remember but i think i was treated slightly differently um, I had to wear a face shield as well, I think. Oh, look, I, I can't mm. really remember. But um, it hasn't been a big thing. No, it hasn't been a big thing. Yeah. But my main concern was knowing that the vaccine wiped out my immune system from day one. When I went into ED um, after that, 
I was left sitting in the waiting room for five hours or something with chest pain. And I'm sitting thinking, this is probably the worst place for me because my immune system's been wiped out. Um, thankfully, I didn't catch COVID. I still haven't had COVID. Um, but I don't normally get colds and flus. So I, I never really sort of thought it was going to be a problem because I don't live in the city. I'm outside more. So, yeah. but yeah, the GP, he's been fine. Great. Unlike Murchison Medical Clinic that wouldn't allow me in the door because I wasn't double vaxxed. Do you, do you think a, a major news outlet would share your story at this stage in Australia's media history? I doubt it. Um, I'm getting more and more frustrated, I guess, with some of the mainstream media. Um, you see that current affair, like a current affair, have no issues covering stories about people that have got long COVID, but they don't cover stories about people like me. And I did send a letter to the editor just recently to a couple of newspapers, regional newspapers. Both of them actually did run it. Um, one, they both gave it an edit and cut sections out so the one paper the main area they cut out was referring to day 10 i had a rash day 14 a black eye day 41 stroke like symptoms so that was cut out of both of them um the other the second one actually which is linked to a major paper like ma more major paper as well but they cut out a lot more mm. um, but they both did leave in there about how um the time Andrew's government needs to relax these mandates. Mm. Um, but yeah, to get like an article or a story on say a current affair or 60 minutes about vaccine injuries or even like the age of the Australian, I, I think the age has covered a little bit about vaccine related injuries, but I haven't heard of anything coming out in the Australian, but I may have missed something too. So. Mm. Mm. But, you know, the, the stories about long COVID can go out. So I think we need to give a balanced view. And mm. even though they go, oh, but you're on the minority, that minority is actually increasing now as people line up for their boosters. And I, I have had a number of people contact me recently in private chats mm. because I have been more vocal about it on some of the Facebook groups. Um, people are private messaging me now. And I spoke to um, a woman a while ago and it was her 19 year old daughter, same symptoms as what I've got. Um, and someone else who's, I think she's mid thirties. She's recently contacted, well, we've been in contact as well. Um, single mum, the booster got her. Mm -hmm. So I think as more and more boosters roll out and even the doctors said to me too, you know, you, the first one, you may not react to the second one. Yeah, you might feel a bit off. The third one will get you maybe for longer. So each time that you have another one, you do react more and more. That's yeah. And that's coming from not just one doctor, but a couple have said that to me. Yeah, There's a, a study that uh, I think was published in Science or Nature, one of those journals, uh, and we'll put it in the um, description in the show notes. Uh, but that came out a month or so ago, and it was likening the, a vaccine injury giving long COVID sim symptoms mm -hmm as much as COVID itself, that you can get low, long COVID from the vaccines as well. So yeah, we'll, we'll put that link in and you may want to have a look at that as well. Yeah, okay. Because I think immune fatigue is, is such a big part of this. Um, it's, you can get that from it, uh, getting COVID, mm -hmm. but I think getting it also from particularly the mRNA vaccines um, is, and, and because this is also new and experimental, um, and, you know, there's not many of us left in the control group of this great, particularly in the, in, in the European, mm -hmm. Anglo-American, European countries. Um, and some people have also mm. said to me too, if you reacted like that to the vaccine, imagine what COVID would have done to you. Yeah. But COVID is a respiratory virus. Um, so that goes in through your nose and it doesn't go straight to your, into your bloodstream and to your heart, mm. which is what the vaccine did. So just because I reacted or people like me have reacted the way we have to the vaccine doesn't necessarily mean that I, I believe doesn't mean that we would have reacted the same way yeah. if we caught COVID. Um, as I said, I don't normally catch colds and flus and yeah. The science is supposedly in that th these vaccines don't um, act biologically. 
um, biologically mm -hmm. active in the body. But how do we know that? Biology is so complex. Yeah. We've had to have these noble lies for all of us to be saved uh, by science. And, <laughs> and I think mm. like when it comes to reporting too, like I self-reported to the TGA um, and then I rang a, a month later when I had a confirmed diagnosis and the woman I spoke to for an hour on the phone, she was fantastic. Um, and she added quite, she kept asking me questions and just kept adding to the list of things I had going on. Um, but you have to self-report. So there's a lot of people out there and I've met some of them who haven't self-reported. They haven't been diagnosed. They've got all the same symptoms, the same as I have. Um, and even this morning I dropped off a car in town, um, at the service center. Um, yeah. And on the way home, I got a lift home and the fellow who brought me back said he doesn't think he's been right since the vaccine either. Mm. And I asked him his symptoms, they're skin related and, and he just feels really lethargic. Mm. So I think there's a lot of people out there now that are probably just starting to join the dots. And I've had a few friends say to me, they just haven't felt right or they mm. did react. Looking back now, they, they did react to the first one or two mm. and they're not going back for the booster. Lethargy is, with friends of ours who have been vaccinated, lethargy is a big, big thing. I never mm. felt a return to their levels of, which again, it sounds like immune fatigue. Correct. Like yeah. Thing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Liz, and um, offering your story. And I just hope you recover. So do I. And that you have your full strength back. And yeah. Yeah. And thanks for doing what you're doing because, yeah, we've got to get these stories out there because they're being missed in mainstream media. Yeah. So thank you.